you be quiet? Why? Amen. Amen. We can go ahead and go back to your seats. On your way back to your seat, tell someone, I got a reason. I got a reason. Hey, guys, I got a couple announcements for you this morning. And then I have a great privilege and honor to introduce a servant of the ministry and a friend of mine. But um, today, I just want to let you guys know, um, where are my scholarship students at? Raise your hand, scholarship student. We love the scholarship students. Hey, there is something that academics has issued to people who work at one, and it's called a lunch line pass. I just want to clear the air because I've heard that there's been a little bit of miscommunications. However, some people do have a lunch line pass because if they aren't able to get in first, they won't be able to actually eat. So with that, if someone has a lunch line pass, we just want to allow them to go to the front, front of the line at the lunchroom so that they can actually eat before going to scholarship or going to work. If you do not have that pass and you do work at one o'clock, then go to the academic, uh, academics department in order to get that approved so that you can be a part of that group. Does that make sense? We good with that? Say yes. Yes. Okay. And then I believe it is tomorrow. We have a slide. Where are my KFN people at? We got KFN people. KFN is having a block party tomorrow at the Student Center Lobby. So we got this slide right here. It's 6.30 to 9 p.m. Come out, show up, show out, and represent for our KFN brothers and sisters. All right? Amen. All right, so I'm, I have the, the great honor and privilege to introduce a servant of Christ of the Nations. This man, he, it, many of you know him, but then some of you know him. And to know him in, is to love him. And um, he's single, so I'm taking applications. So if you know anybody that wants to be blessed by a mighty man of honor and the Lord, I, um, yeah, we have a formal application statement that me and Golan will be able to vet you and all that kind of stuff if you know someone back home. Anyways, please welcome Kiplin Bachelor to the stage. Let's go. Praise God for that. Can we give it up for the worship team? That was, thank you. That's my favorite song for the season. It really is. So that song has been a blessing and I'm uh, so grateful to be here. I want to give it up to Golan and Pastor Adam and the, lead and the leadership team for, for asking me to share on this subject again. Some of you might have heard part or portions of it before. If you have, I want you to picture it as being at the gym. You lift the same dumbbell, right? The same. And your muscles grow. I want you to think of it like that. Or if you're a lady, it's the same lipstick that you put on and you feel beautiful. You, you, you look beautiful. Same, same idea behind this. I want to talk to you today about the subject of honor. Yes, they requested it. <laughs> um, it is important in the kingdom of God. It absolutely is. I want us to think about it and I want us to spend time on it this morning. I normally preach and get excited, but I want to teach it this morning. I'm a very, you know, passionate, excited preacher, and I, I love that side, but I, I want to teach this one. But let's see where God is going with it, all right? Let's see what he will do. Okay, so if you can turn with me in your Bibles to, I'll start with the scripture. Let me see, Matthew 21. We're going to read a little bit, so bear with me this morning. It's a Bible school, so we're going to read a little bit. So Matthew 21, we're going to start from verse 1. That's Matthew 21. We're going to go from verse 1 to verse 11. So that's the New Testament, Matthew 21. Have you all found it? All right, yeah, talk to me. You all found it? Okay, great. And I will read. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them 
to go ahead. And he said, go into the villages over there. And he said, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He's humble and he's riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and all the people around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. The King James says, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. Verse 10 says, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they ask. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. The prophet from Galilee. That's Matthew 21. Let's go to Mark 6. We're, we're Bible school, so we're reading this morning. Mark 6. That's the book after Matthew. For those of you who don't know, hopefully you know by now. So Mark 6. Have you found it? Mark 6, and it reads... Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown, among his relatives and within his own family. And because of their unbelief, he could do no mighty miracles among them, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we draw our hearts to your table and we say, God, feed us as only you can. Open up our eyes and unlock our ears that we might see, that we might hear you, Lord God, that we might see your kingdom this morning. Lord, I thank you for every heart that is here this morning. Lord, let there be receptivity to your words, God. Let there be no confusion. Let there be no opposition to your word, God. Let our hearts be like fertile soils that we would receive the seed of the word. And that it will germinate and grow and bear much fruit. Lord, thank you for illuminating our understanding this morning. Thank you for elevating us to another level in you and in your kingdom this morning. And the people of God say, amen, amen. So honor is important in the kingdom of God. I can't stress just how important it is. When you grow up in a Pentecostal context or a charismatic context, it's easy to ignore or take Something like this for granted because when you're a Pentecostal person and you're predominantly charismatic, we tend to focus on miracles. We tend to focus on signs and wonders. I've been here 16 years and every time when I talk to students, the excitement that I hear from them, it is always surrounding something miraculous. Something supernatural, like they'll say to me, Kiplin, you know, I spoke in tongues last night and the excitement. Or, you know, that person got healed. That person got set free from drugs. There is a preoccupation with the supernatural. And that is good. We need that. 
absolutely so. So don't think I'm against the supernatural. We need miracles. We need signs. And we need wonders. It is a part of the kingdom. But the kingdom of God is not only constituted by signs and wonders and miracles. The kingdom of God is a very comprehensive thing. It's very comprehensive. So if you only focus on signs and wonders and miracles, you will be lopsided. You will lack things in the kingdom of God. And God wants us to be rounded. Say rounded. God wants us to be, I heard that American accent, rounded. <laughs> God wants us to be, my, my Jamaican, God wants us to be rounded. He wants us to be balanced, to be whole, so that we're not lacking the comprehensive nature of the kingdom of God. So I've seen the excitement and I hear it. And as I grow in God, I've realized this over the years, that the younger you are in Christianity, the more you focus on the miraculous disproportionately so. And I realize the more you grow in God is the more you focus on the character of God. Let me say that again. The younger you are in your, in your Christianity is the more you focus on the supernatural, the signs and the wonders. And as you grow in God, the person of God, the character of God becomes more important. And so in the text, Jesus isn't talking about miracles. He's not talking about signs and wonders and the supernatural. He's touching on the subject of honor. You really don't hear people talk a lot about it. Or if they do, they talk about it at a very super, super, superficial level. But in the text, in both texts, you see God presents honor to us in a very forceful way. He presents it to us that we have to pause, to think, to reflect on the fact that honor is important in God's kingdom. And it is not a new concept because if you read the Bible carefully, you will see when God introduced the notion, the concept of honor to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. He said, honor your parents. It began there. He said, honor your parents. And it's not just the authority to honor them because they are the authority above you, but it is to honor them because of love and because they are close to you. So honor Jesus picked up on what was in the Old Testament, right? It's, it's, all of it belongs to him. And here it is in the New Testament that he is presenting it to us, that honor is important. But it is how Jesus conceptualizes honor that intrigues me. It is how he puts it into context that amazes me, actually. Jesus says, a prophet is without honor in his own country, in his own family, and among his own relatives. That's what Jesus said. So the context of honor right there shows me that there is, and you can put up the slide as I go there, it's, it's the lurking danger in familiarity, dishonor. The lurking danger in familiarity. Stick with me this morning. Jesus says it is always the people who are close to you that dishonors you, that dishonor you. It is always, let me slow down the frames, it is always the people who are close to us. It is never the stranger. Jesus literally said that. You receive honor everywhere except for those who are in your own house among your own relatives and within your own country. Dishonor, there is a lurking danger in familiar places. You will go out and preach and people will celebrate you and the roommate that is in your room won't even recognize that you're a preacher. You will leave this country and go to another country and somebody will praise you. They will roll out the red carpet. But those who are close to you will take you for granted. Jesus says proximity, familiarity has a way of being corrosive if we are not careful. And that's why I say there is a danger a danger in familiarity. You have to be careful. A husband, I see this so many times, husband and wives, you will have women outside of the house, outside, will celebrate a man and the wife will speak so terribly about the, about the husband. Or you will see the opposite. You will have friendships 
Other people will celebrate you, but it is always the friend who is close to you, who tears you down, who stabs you in the back, who undermines you, who assassinates your character, who tears down your reputation. Jesus is saying to us that honor, honor, honor typically happens on the outside. Dishonor happens on the inside. And the context right here is that the first verse, it says, Jesus left another village and he came to his hometown. Jesus came to Nazareth. That's where Jesus grew up. The backstory to this is that Jesus just completed ministering in Samaria. You know, the Samaritan woman. Are you with me? The Samaritan woman. She ran and she preached that Jesus gave her a word and she was transformed. And the Bible said, the entire city... That city in Samaria rushed out to meet Jesus. And they asked him, can you stay here an, an, another day? Can you stay here? And the Bible said that Jesus stayed three days in Samaria. And the city went into revival. A Samaritan city went into revival. People were healed, delivered, set free. And Jesus left that revival and came back home to his village, Nazareth. And when he opened up the scrolls and began to teach, began to preach, the Bible said they were amazed, but they shifted quickly from amazement to offense. And then they said, is this not the carpenter? So understand this with me. Walk this through with me. He was celebrated by Samaria, but when he came to his own village, they had a problem with him. And understand why they had a problem with him. Because Jesus left Nazareth a carpenter, but he came back as a prophet. Oh my God. I wanted to teach this, but I wanted to teach this, but I feel I feel preaching inside of me. I said he left a carpenter. He grew up with Mary and Joseph working on wood, making furniture, making chairs and tables. He left a carpenter, but he returned. A prophet, he was baptized by, uh, by John the Baptist at the River Jordan, went and preached and taught, healed and delivered people. It was at the River Jordan where John said to him, you are the Christ and the Spirit of God came upon him. His ministry was launched, but when he came back home, that's where the rejection showed up. That's where the dishonor showed up, right in Nazareth. The people who were familiar with him, the people who knew him, the people who watched him work with wood, the people who passed him by the street, the people who sat down and had lunch with Jesus, the people who went to the grocery store with him, the people who probably went to the river with him or went wherever. I'm saying people who knew him. The Bible said it has customary. He went to the synagogue, people in the church, people synagogue, people who knew him. And they were offended. Is this not the carpenter? So they defined him by his profession as opposed to his calling. Oh my God, I'm going to take time with this. I said they defined him by his profession as opposed to his calling. And this honor has a way of cloaking itself in a very subtle and deceptive way. People who are close to you will recognize your earthly profession, but they can't perceive your divine calling. That's a problem. That's a problem. You cannot just know me as the accountant and you don't know that God has called me to go to the nations. You cannot just know me as a secretary and not know what God has put inside me. You are missing if you don't know my divine calling. And so, and so they will dishonor the Christ in you because they are celebrating the earthly profession. That's what happened with Jesus. Is this not the carpenter? Is this not the carpenter? Is this not the carpenter? So they were offended. Familiarity. The danger. As I walk through this this morning, I want you to think right here. I want you to pause right here and think to the, about the people who are close to you. This is where you pause. The people who are close to you. How do you treat the people who are close to you? I'm not talking about Beyonce that you watch on TV, that you praise easily. 
I'm not talking about the superstar that you talk about them all the while. How do you treat the people who are close to you? I'm telling you this morning, Jesus experienced dishonor. He did. Jesus, the King, the Messiah, God incarnate, experienced dishonor. And that's why he's introducing the topic to us to let us know that dishonor is a real thing. And so conversely, honor is a real thing. But hear what Jesus said. A prophet is without honor. A prophet. Every word matters for Jesus. Jesus is not superficial with words. Every word. He says a prophet. He didn't say a man or a woman. A prophet. Somebody who is called by God. Somebody who is anointed by God. Somebody in whom God has put words for you. Someone whom God has sent to you. A prophet is without honor in his own family, country, and home. Jesus is saying, it is somebody who is spiritual in your life. It is somebody who is connected with heaven that we typically dishonor. Oh my God, can I take time with this? Oh, yes, it's true. The people who you smoke with and the people who you drink with and have sex with, you don't really dishonor those people. It is always somebody who has an anointing upon their lives. It is always somebody who speaks the word of God to you. It is always someone who walks with the presence that something in you rises up against them and you feel you should dishonor, disregard them. It is always someone who has a spiritual calling upon them that we dis um, a prophet. A prophet is without honor. A prophet is without honor. A prophet. And so you have to ask yourself the question, why would anybody attack a prophet? Are you with me? Why would anybody dishonor a prophet from God? Why would anybody undermine a prophet from God? The clue that Jesus is showing to us is something about dishonor is devilish. Because it goes after people who are anointed and called people prophets. It goes after people who are chosen by God, filled with words from God in their mouth. Something about dishonor is devious. It comes from the enemy's camp. It's true. The spirit of dishonor, it comes from the enemy's camp. If they dishonor you long enough, they will betray you. Dishonor is the fermenting seeds or are the fermenting seeds. Watch, you have to observe people and watch them. If they honor, if they dishonor you long enough, over time they will, they will betray you. Lucifer in heaven, it was a dishonoring spirit. Judas, it was a dishonoring spirit. You, you call it, you name it. Every, every betrayal begins with the seed of dishonor. It germ, that's where it germinates. You have to be careful. You have to be careful how you get familiar with people. My second point, that's the lurking danger in familiarity. Lurking danger. People who are close to you. And that's why we have to be intentional. Because Jesus is saying they are so close that you take them for granted. They are so close that you take them for granted. They are so close that you don't see them. They are so close that you do not point to perceive the value inside of them. That point is powerful. You, <laughs> the perception, the perception of value precedes honor. You cannot and you will not honor people that you don't perceive value in. If you perceive me as a trash, you will treat me as a trash. This is the Bible, it is the word of God. To the extent that you can perceive value inside of me, it is to the extent that you will treat me honorably. Watch how people treat people. It tells you how they perceive them. Observe how people treat my katalabuku setete. I said, observe how people treat you. Observe it. Pay attention. Don't get lost in people just being around you. Pay attention how people treat you. Watch, observe how people treat you. 
and you can tell how they perceive you. Perception is important. Perception. Perception. I was in Switzerland a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago, and trash, trash. In Jamaica, trash is perceived as trash. You tr throw it out and you burn it. In Switzerland, they perceive their trash as renewable energy. So no trash is wasted in Switzerland. Everything, is go everything goes back into renewable energy. They send it to a factory and they renew it. I'm saying perception. Do you perceive it as trash where you really throw it away or do you perceive it as a renewable source? Perception is important. And that's what was happening to Jesus here. They said, who do you think you are? You are just a carpenter. Perception. Cannot perceive that he is the Messiah. Cannot perceive that he is God incarnate. Cannot perceive that he is heaven's treasure among us. Cannot perceive that he is the living word. Cannot perceive that is he who was promised by Moses, promised by Abraham. Cannot perceive that he is the fulfillment of the law. They only perceived a carpenter. And we see this throughout the Bible. David, David's father only perceived him as a shepherd. When Samuel came to anoint the king, God said, go anoint. I have chosen a king. The father had eight sons and the father chose the seven sons and left the one that the anointing. You, you heard me, left the one that the anointing was on. Left the one in the field that God's anointing and calling was on. Why in the world would a father leave a son, and you know that any one of the eight could be chosen. Perceived in him, oh, he's too young for this. Too young for this. Perception of value. How do you perceive people? Do you see the value in people? The roommate that you have, do you just see, oh, that, that, that's an international Okay, I'm taking my time with this. Oh, that's just an international. Or do you perceive the worth in the international? You would be amazed how the, the industrialized nations perceive some of the third world countries. How do you perceive people? Or even the color of the skin. Oh, he's, he's just a black guy. How do you perceive people? Or just a white guy. How do you perceive? That's just an Asian. How do you perceive people? How will you get anything from me if you perceive me as a trash? How can my giftings bless you if you perceive me as a trash? Oh my God, come on, talk to me this morning. How can my intellect bless you if you perceive me as a fool? How can the intercessory anointing upon my life be a blessing to you if you don't even perceive me as an intercessor? How will you ever invite me to lead worship if you don't even perceive me as a singer or a worshiper? So many people have been left out, access denied, simply because of how other people have perceived them. Perception of value precedes honor. Don't fool yourselves. If you don't perceive me good, you will never treat me good. It's true. Can I go deeper into it? Perception of value. When Dr. Lindsay walks on the stage, our goal and we perceive value because of their positions. We're like, yeah, 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 yeah. The janitor that walks in, you don't do that to the janitor. As a matter of fact, the janitor, we, we walk by it. We walk by the janitor. Because in our culture, we perceive worth with titles. And oh, I'm going there. We perceive worth with titles and we perceive worth with fame. If you are famous, yeah, yeah, yes. That's the culture that we live in. Kerry Job, if you hear Kerry Job is coming about, yeah, yeah. And you are here and you, you, you wait three, four hours in a line. But before Kerry Job was popular, she was just an ordinary young woman right here in the choir. 
and nobody knew Kerry Job. Hidden, obscure, unknown, unrecognized on the choir. But somebody perceived worth in Kerry Job. Somebody. Somebody, Klaus Kuhn, somebody heard Kerry Job and said, I heard something in that girl. There is something up on her. Something. And he said, you know what? I'm inviting you to come on the worship team. Can you sing this song? When nobody knew Kerry Job, somebody perceived worth in that woman. Let me tell you something about the secular people. They have to see you to celebrate you. Secular people, it's when you have made it that they celebrate you. The kingdom is different. That's why I'm talking about kingdom honor today. The kingdom is different. The kingdom perceives it in you before you arrive there. Oh, you didn't get that. <laughs> you didn't get that. Let me say that again. The secular people, they wait until you become a star for them to celebrate you. You achieve it and they recognize you because they look in the flesh. When you're in the kingdom, you are spiritually discerned. It is about the spiritual discernment. It is about seeing the way God sees people. So before they reach it, before David ever sat upon a throne is what I'm saying. Samuel says, you are the king of Israel. Can I talk to somebody? Before he ever wore a crown on his head, before he ever wore a sash, before he ever sat in the palace, before he reigned over the 12 tribes, before he ruled over the nation of Israel, he was a shepherd, but the prophet had enough spirit in him to perceive the king in the shepherd boy. You have to be walking with God to look at the shepherd and say, you're a king. You have to be in the spirit to see that. How can you celebrate a shepherd and call him a king? He doesn't have any degree. He doesn't have any status. He's not in the military. He's not a part of the aristocracy. He's not a part of the nobility. How do you know a king in the shepherd boy? Unless God reveals it to you. Unless you're spiritually connected. So perception of value precedes honor. Samuel poured the oil because, because he perceived. The wise men, I call them wise worshipers. Are you still with me? The wise worshipers. Look at the expression of honor right here. The Bible said that they came in to the city all the way from Persia, 1,100 plus miles they journeyed, came into Jerusalem, Bethlehem. And they opened up and presented their treasures. Pause right here. Jesus wasn't sitting on a throne when they presented gold. Think about this with me. Jesus was not sitting on a throne with a scepter in his hand. Neither did he have a crown on his head. Neither did he have an entourage of 200 people and 10 security around him. He did not have any of that. What did Jesus have? How do you present gold to a baby wearing, wearing what is it, swaddling clothes? Unless you perceive the king in the baby. Do you see what I'm saying about perception? How do you see the king in the manger? How do you see the king on the backside of the desert? David and Jesus. They both went through that. You have to have perception. You have to perceive people rightly. And I'm not talking about just perceiving me because I have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. You have to go beyond that. Perceive me as a child of God. That's the ultimate perception. That's the ultimate perception. Too many people, oh, Kipling, Kipling, Kipling is doing a doctorate. And how many times I see people get excited over that? Perceive me. No, because if you appreciate me in part, there might be another part of me that you might kill me because you don't appreciate that part. Appreciate me in full, in total, in whole. 
Your ultimate perception must be that woman is a woman of God. That's a daughter of God. That guy, I know he doesn't have a degree, but he's a, what, he's a son of God. He's a son in the kingdom of God. The ultimate perception. To the degree that you perceive me as a child of God, you will honor me, you will regard me, you will value me, you will treat me well. So the lurking danger, that was number one. Number two. That was the perception. Number three, godly honor does not discriminate. Say that with me. Godly honor, it does not discriminate. And look why it doesn't discriminate. Look at what Jesus says. He says, whatever you, did, whatever you do or did to the least of these you have done to me. I want you to understand, Jesus identifies himself with the people. He identifies himself with the people. So when you look down on people, who are, you re who are you really looking down on? When Saul was persecuting the church, Jesus said to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? The people were running. They were fleeing. They were oppressed. <laughs> they were abused. But God says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus, ident if Jesus therefore identifies with people, how can you treat them like they are trash? How can you undermine them and disregard them? I'm saying Jesus places value. They might be sinful. Jesus places value. They might be broken. Jesus places value. They might come from a third world. Jesus places value on them. They might be uneducated. Jesus places value. They might be unpolished. Jesus places value. They might can't speak English well. Jesus places value on people. If Jesus does it, you have to. And I've seen this throughout the years. Upward. When people think of honor, I think this is how we think culturally. We think upward, upward, vertical. Don't you all agree with that? It's true. We think of people in positions. We think of people above. But guys, honor is vertical. Yes, we are called to honor people in positions of authority. Our leaders, we're called to do that. Our parents, we're called to honor people in positions of authority over us. But it is also horizontal. It is also lateral. And it is also downward. That's the cross. Honor, that's the cross. You honor those. You honor the Dr. Lindsay's. You honor the Golans. You honor the Miss Susan Boza. They have been here. You honor the deans. That's, that's vertical. But people on your level, and this is where a lot of people struggle. This is where many people struggle because you will give it upwards because you recognize the obvious. But when it comes to the people who are, again, on your level, you struggle right here. One of the most amazing examples that I have found in the Bible is actually John the Baptist. John was just a few months older than Jesus. And when nobody recognized Jesus in the crowd of people by the River Jordan where John was baptizing people, nobody recognized. Think about it. Jesus was in the crowd, Miss Susan. We don't know how many days Jesus just hung out in the crowd. We don't know. Jesus could have been hanging out, just showing up at John the Baptist's meetings for two weeks, three weeks, two months. Who knows? But the point is, Jesus was in the crowd. And then all of a sudden, one day, Jesus showed up. And John said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This man, I'm not even worthy to untie the lace on his shoe. Behold the Lamb of God. Spiritualize. It's the perception for sure. Right? He saw him spiritually. But the point is, John was a few months older than Jesus. John was Jesus' peer. And we know that because when Mary, she went to Elizabeth. And the Bible says, and the babes leaped in the womb. They were just a few months older. But yet still, this guy who is so close to him in age, he says, behold the Lamb of God. In other words, John was celebrating Jesus' calling. Many of us, it is so hard to celebrate and honor and regard and value people who are close to us. On the same level. 
Oh, you hear it. Oh, Dr. Lindsay, you're such an awesome man. How do you talk about your roommate? How do you talk about your roommate? Or you say, man, Golan is so awesome. Or Kipling is so awesome. How do you talk about your roommate? Vertical, horizontal, lateral. I'm encouraging, honor people who are at your level. Because if you only honor people who are above you, that is superficial. Because Jesus doesn't do it, so we can call it superficial. It is false and it is fake. Watch people who only honor people who have titles. Watch them, observe them. Because they will trample you. If they only celebrate people who are going up, they will trample you. Watch, and watch your heart too. Celebrate people on your level. Okay, so that's the vertical, the lateral. Let's deal with the, the, the people who we think are beneath us. Because the flesh goes there. People who we think are... Look at how Jesus dealt with people who were, in a sense, beneath, right? That's how the flesh would look at it. The woman at the well. Jesus went to the woman at the well and waited three and a half hours. Think about that. The Messiah, God incarnate, went and sat and just waited for one woman. Numero uno. Is it numero uno? No. Solo uno. <laughs> solo. Solo uno, right? Something. One woman. Do you know that their preachers will never go to a church if they, have one, if, if they have like 15 or 20 people? Because they have to find 200 and 500 and 5,000 people. Jesus went for one. How do you treat the one? And the one that you think is a Jezebel. Oh, we're going somewhere, miss. The one that you think is a Jezebel. Jesus waited on a woman who slept with five men. Married. And the one that she was with was not even hers. Jesus waited. Can you imagine the honor that she felt? And we see part of it, she said, how is it that you are a leader, a rabbi in Israel, that you are here speaking to me. She's shocked. Because she knows she, she, he shouldn't even be having a conversation with her. How do you treat people who you think are beneath you? When you honor, don't just do it vertically. Don't just do it horizontally, laterally. Do it if you think. The people who are unrecognized, uncelebrated. Do it to them also. Amen. Are you guys enjoying this? Yes, <laughs> All right. All right. Let's look at the other one. Honor brings blessings. Honor brings blessings. Listen to what the Bible says. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. That is Jesus talking to us. This is it right here. He who receives a prophet. Here we go again. Spiritual with words in their mouth from God. Called by God. Appointed by God. Sent by God. He who receives. But the operative word in the text is receive. That's part of how you honor people. Do you receive? Do you accept? This is the person that God has put in my life. This is. This is. Do you know that people are in relationships and don't even, don't even realize that the person in their life is a gift from God to them? And if a gift from God... Blessings come with it. Let me say that again. Because we just think, oh, John is in my life. <laughs> oh, Mary is in my life. Oh, yeah, my friend is Mary. My friend is Tom. My friend is whatever. Does it occur to us that when God positions somebody in our lives, that they come with blessings? Noted. Some of the people who will cover you, cover your shame. Cover your reproach, pray for you, stand with you, support you loyally, defend your name, defend your reputation. People are gifts to us from God. And so blessings come with it. They shall receive a prophet's reward. So to the extent that you receive, 
accept, acknowledge this is the gift from God to me. It is to the extent that you will receive the blessing that accompanies or accompany the person. I don't even understand the depth, the gravity, Miss Susan, of this word. You will receive a prophet's reward. I, don't, I mean, I've read it so many times and I'm wondering, what was Jesus talking about? Is it miracles? Is it signs? Is it wonders? Is it a revelation of truth? What is a prophet's reward? I don't know the fullness of it, but all I know is that Jesus said, if you receive honor, you will be rewarded. Think about that. Are you receiving? So blessings come with it. So the opposite is true. When you dishonor people, you shut up blessings. You restrict blessings in your life. And you say, Keep now, you're making that up, is that your concept? No, go back to Mark 6. Mark 6. And the Bible says, and he, Jesus, could do no mighty works in Nazareth because of their unbelief in him. That's not Kipling's word, that's Jesus. And he could do no mighty works. How in the world can the Messiah's hands be tied? That ruffles my theology. It really does. How could Jesus not do mighty works in Nazareth? How could God in flesh not do mighty works? So it tells me that the spirit of dishonor hinders the supernatural from flowing. It hinders blessing, no mighty works. Nazareth, Jesus' own village, missed out on blessings. And listen to what Jesus qualifies it as. He said, could not receive, sorry, he could not do mighty, mighty works. I wonder if we are missing mighty works because we don't honor people. Oh my God. I wonder if we are missing mighty works because we don't honor even this institution. I wonder if we are missing mighty works because we don't honor the deans. I wonder if we're missing mighty works because we don't honor the parents. You jump in the IB, but you are disrespectful to your parents. You undermine their, 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 their leadership. How can you expect the anointing of God to flow inside of you and upon you in the chapel while you don't even talk to your parents? How are you hindering your destiny? How are you hindering the accession of your destiny in your life because of how you treat people? The kingdom of God is relational. It's not only power. Honor is important because the kingdom of God is relational. When you're done speaking in tongues, I want to know how are you treating me. When you finish dancing in the IB, I want to know how are you treating me. When you finish jumping for the worship song, I want to know how are you speaking to me. Are you rude? Are you condescending? Are you, are you undermining? Do you intimidate me in, in my presence? Do you speak ill of me? I want to know when you get out of the power dynamic, the relational dynamic exists in the kingdom. So blessings. He could do no mighty works. This struck me, I have four minutes to go. This struck me, I thought, look at this with me. Look at this, look at this. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. Nazareth could have reaped great blessings. The people who were most familiar with him, they could have received the greatest blessings. But they did not. Do you know what happened right here? If you study your Bible carefully, they tried to throw Jesus out of the city. Pushed him. Brought him up on a hill and pushed him out of the city. How could people who I've known for years... You bring me up on the brow of the hill and you, you try to throw me. What is that? You've watched me pray. You've watched me worship. You've watched me lay hands on people. You've heard my sermons. You've seen me in the synagogue. Yet still you want to throw me over the brow of the hill. Do you know what happened? Jesus left Nazareth and made Capernaum his headquarters. 
the dishonor was so terrible that Jesus transitioned. Where Nazareth could have been the place of great miracles, they missed it because of dishonor. And Capernaum reaped it. Read the Bible. Capernaum reaped the blessings. The revival, the headquarters of the revival, it was from Capernaum. Blessings come with honor. Don't let anybody fool you. To the extent that you honor people, you will reap a reward. And I don't know the fullness of what the reward is, but you will reap it. And the last point I want to cover here with you, honor flows out of love. Say this with me, honor flows out of love. You can't honor people if you just try work it up. This work up thing is unsustainable. The Bible says it is love that never fails. To the extent that you operate in love, to the extent that honor flows out of love, it will be sustained. You can maintain honor if it is housed, contextualized, flowing out of love. Anything that you do out of duty will frustrate you over time. Or if it doesn't frustrate you, it breeds apathy. After a while, you're like, oh. I bought the roses for three years. You get tired of buying roses because you just did it out of duty. Or you used to respect Miss Susan. You just did it out of, oh, she was my teacher. No, you are out of CF&I, so you're like, oh, whatever. She's just, you know, the respect goes. But if it is born out of love, it constantly renews inside of you. And it grows inside of you. Hear me. Honor can grow, it can appreciate, and it can depreciate. As you, as you navigate school here at CFN, I want you to think about this. Will your honor increase over time in somebody's eyes, or will it decrease? Watch that. Watch how you love people. Let it grow, because love has the capacity to let honor grow inside of you. So you say to me, as I close with this, you say to me, Kipling, what is honor? Let me just list the definitions right here. It is to regard people. It is to respect people. It is to show legitimacy, as in positions. Dr. Lindsay is the president. I am not the president. We respect his position. Golan is the operational leader. We respect positions. It is to reward. Someone has done something meaningful for you. You recognize their contribution. That's part of honor. Someone has done something great. Albert Einstein, you discover the theory of relativity or you conceptualize it. Transform the world. You recognize this person has contributed this. That's honor. And you see the list there. Honor is to walk in integrity. You treat people rightly. And you treat people fairly. Stand with me today. As you navigate your life here at CF and as you navigate your role as students, as you navigate your relationships and your friendships, I encourage you to walk in honor. Before we go, I just want us to, I know some of them are going, some of them have to go. But if we can do this quickly, if we can just turn to each other, and I just want to pray the pray honor over each other. Can we do that? For those of you who are not leaving, I understand some of you have to go, but if you don't have to go, let's just take a minute and let's just pray honor a culture, kingdom culture. Find someone quickly and let's just pray this and just encourage them. Say, I want you to walk in honor. I want you to treat people well and treat people rightly. Come on, go for it for one minute. Let's do this. Yes, come on, release that relational power.
Yes, relational anointing, Jesus. Release it in this house, oh God. Father, we thank you for a spirit of honor to sweep across, to rest upon every student, that they will walk in honor, live in it, think it, abide in it, serve on the job in honor. Be thoughtful of others. Be mindful of other people. Lord, let it be released. Let it be released. And Father, even right now, I break every spirit of dishonor that has risen up against any student in here. I take authority against dishonor in the name of Jesus. And I declare that you are free from it. You are delivered from it today. That this truth is setting you free. Every dishonor to parents, to people in authority, to friends, to people who you think are beneath you. We rebuke that mindset. We bind that spirit, that attitude now in Jesus' name. And we say it has no right, it has no place, it has no authority. Let there be a release, a supernatural release of honor upon the worship team, of honor in the media, in our departments, in every department. Lord, let it sweep across this organization. Let it infiltrate, invade every employee. Lord, every part, every part of this organization, we declare honor, honor, kingdom honor. Lord, that we would esteem each other, celebrate each other, not be jealous, not be envious. To worship you, Jesus. To do it the way you do it. To do it the way you do it. Somebody's leaving here today renewed in your heart. Leaving here knowing how to treat people well. You might not agree with them, doesn't mean you can't honor them. You might not agree with their views or their beliefs. Doesn't mean you can't honor them. Doesn't mean you shouldn't honor them. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. To worship you, Lord God. Yes. To worship you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. If there's anybody who wants to talk to me about this, you're welcome. If you need special prayers, they're keeping them struggling with dishonor. If you want to come, I can pray with you. Thank you, Jesus.